This episode is sponsored by Furniture Box. Check them out in the description below. Guys, yeah. welcome back to the Ground Floor Podcast, the podcast where we are successful people exactly how they did it. Uh, our guest today is Paul Archer, who is the founder of Dual Technologies, which is a brand advocacy platform for e-commerce brands. And he is also the host of his very own podcast, which he's going to talk about in a moment. So, Paul, thanks so much for being here, man. Thanks for having me. No problem. Our pleasure. Um, so, for anyone that doesn't know, um, do you want to give a little sort of brief background about who you are and what you do? Uh, yeah, so I'm um, CEO and founder of a company called Jewel. We uh, work with brands that people love. So some of the largest, most exciting, passion-based retail brands, makeup brands, lots of lots of dresses and lipstick, basically. Um, and we basically help them um, engage with the people who are passionate about what they do, and then turn them into advocates who can actually help grow the brand. You know, and that is done across social media. It's done across the internet. Any way they can support and recommend. Um, we make the software that the brands use to interact with that person so that they can go out there and advocate for it. Mm. That's kind of the most exciting part of marketing, I feel like, especially now when everyone's kind of doing the same sort of strategies with a lot of things like getting mm. UGC and getting people to actually like speak for your brand. That's the kind of the best promotion, you know? Yeah, exactly. And, and, and the problem is doing it at scale, right? So so the way to get a brand out there in the world is, is it's, it's, it's got to be real. It's got to be authentic. Like mm. We can see through it when someone is being paid to pretend to like a brand because next week they're going to be paid to pretend to like their competitor brand. And we've, yeah, we've yeah. all seen that a thousand yeah, yeah. times. But there are some people and they're like, you know what? I really use this and I love it. And you're like, yeah. Yeah, right. I'm, I'm, I'm going to go make a purchase. And so it is that authenticity. And, and at the heart of that is the fact that they're a real customer. They're a fan. They use a product, whatever that may be. And what brands need to be able to do is to activate those people who are all within their network, right? They, they are within their customer database. They follow them on social. Um, they need to actually activate them so they can start being an advocate getting out there yeah. telling their brand message they want to be able to the brand then needs to be able to track that so they can reward them celebrate them incentivize them so they get much more of it and so what we do at jewel is that we allow them to do that at, at massive scale so tens of thousands of people um managing the relationships with them so that it becomes a new channel and something which means that they can the, the vision is that if we can make it as easy to grow through your people as buying a Facebook ad, then we'd be able to you know, provide a, a much better um, opportunity mm. for growing than actually spending all that money with Zuckerberg, who A, doesn't need it, and B, it's, it's not a great way yeah, of doing yeah. it anyway. It doesn't yeah. build long-term brand love. So so that's ultimately what we do. And it's a SaaS platform. We work with the, the larger size of brands because of the scale that we do. And um, uh, we're, we're having quite a lot of fun with it. It's been a, been a good couple of years. And can you just give us a bit more of an idea from the sort of technical standpoint of how the software works? works for for each of the clients that you work with in terms of actually activating those customers yeah so um <clears throat> think of it as a completely white labeled uh database that they have at the back end there for their advocates so what it does is it powers uh, an interactive portal on the brand's website where you can set anything you want challenges tasks missions activities they can upload content they can track revenue that they've driven for it they can also get rewards so discounts and VIP experiences, whatever it may be, the brand can build pretty much any experience, any program for a community that they have. And that community would be multi, there'd be multiple communities under any brand, you know, um, you know, at the, the base of it, your largest communities, your customers, um, you know, the idea of like activating them in a way that's much better than a loyalty program. So mm -hmm. you can reward them for what they do as well as what they buy. But then there's loads of other elements to this as well you could have your employees a massive source of advocacy who if they were to be posting out to their own networks or own social channels can drive a lot of revenue can drive a lot of a lot of brand narrative and brand love in that sense to the ones you would expect your creators your micro nano influencers mm. um but athletes right the way up to some of those more macro influencers who are doing really cool things and so the brands will use our technology to centralize and coordinate all of those different communities of advocates um, all under one platform and um, building slightly different programs for each one and then, then managing it at that scale that you need. So you'll have you know, hundreds of thousands of customers. You'll have a few thousand uh, employees if you're a big retail store. Um, and then you'll have you know, a couple of thousand creators and, and mm. micro-influencers, all of whom, if they're going out there and telling the brand's message and, and getting that brand story out towards their own networks, their own personal following, um, that way you can drive this authentic um, messaging in a way that you just cannot get if you're trying to buy that with ads in any way and, and mm. generally these guys are doing it because they love the brand they're doing it because they're getting free product from the brand and free incentives or being brought closer to the brand and it's that realness which is what 
drives the trust in the communication mm. and it's that trust which is what drives the commerce the actual purchase drive it's not about likes it's not about views yeah. it's about actual revenue that's been driven by it and the best way of doing that is by searching for authenticity and that's that's all what we're about i also think that like on that note that's a really good point because I, I i've been feeling for the longest time obviously we make content and we're in that space and in the kind of content cycle of things and i feel like because content is now king and everyone's focused on you know digital strategy and things like that it does feel like it has become sort of commodified to a point where it feels less authentic it's more like we need to get content out rather than like it used to be hey let's make content because this is a cool thing and it'd be cool to show off this thing about our brand or our product whereas now it's like okay we need to have x many shorts x many videos x many posts the blog posts with the seo audio transcribed and it's like how do you think you keep that authenticity in the age of oversaturation so i think a huge part of this is about the monetization of it so you guys run a podcast, you know, sponsors will be the ones who are supporting you in, in allowing that to happen. Um, allowing you to get sponsors to add their brand narrative to the content you're creating. Sometimes it may be in the form of an ad, or it can be some sort of advertorial when you're actually advocating for a product that you guys love. That is normal across social media. So what we're, we're, we're kind of edging, not we're, we're, we're banging in the middle of it, actually, we're not beginning. We're in the sort of the social commerce phase of the internet. You know, e-commerce, that growth from uh, 2010 to 2020, you know, huge amounts of growth um, that, that we've all seen and experienced. And there were two very clear winners. You've got Meta, you've got Google. And they are now the gatekeepers, and they're basically they've 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 won the monopoly board. They've built a hotel on every single um, stand. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I like that analogy. <laughs> and now, whenever you land on it, they're going to charge you rent. And so, actually, your cost of acquisition has sort of tripled. Um, so that's that makes things really really challenging for a brand who's trying to get out there and trying to push it. And then, so the other alternative they've got is well, instead of just buying ads over the content, because that's where the attention is. So people aren't watching TV; they're scrolling on Instagram, they're scrolling on TikTok. Um, they like you can either buy the ads, pay Google for it, or you can embed yourself into that content itself and into the culture and in into the way. culture. Yeah, exactly. And it's about finding someone who is like aligned, who loves what you do. So when they talk about it, they talk authentically and with, with passion. Um, and then creating partnerships um, from from a brand's perspective. And then for the content creator, they would not be able to do what they do unless they had some way of sponsoring it and the people who are sponsoring it are brands and so it's a really good match of of needs is that a content creator doesn't want to go get a job working behind yeah. a bar so they can mm -hmm. do they want to create content um and the way that they can create content professionally is if someone pays for it and yes you have things like um patreon and, and things like that but at the end of the day the majority of of creators are funded by brands and so it's about actually getting that kind of combination to them we basically make the infrastructure that the brands use to do that at scale because yeah. previously you may have done influencer marketing with five or 10 different people. That's okay. You've got mm. a spreadsheet. You've got a, you, yeah. you, you know them by name, you pick it up. We've, we worked with a, a jewelry brand who started working with us. We had, we're working with 30 brand ambassadors um, who were generally fashion creators. And they went from 30 to 1,000 within a month and then from 1,000 to over 10,000 within a year. Wow. And this then created a brand new channel for them in terms of actual customer acquisition that mm. was far outstripping and, 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 and succeeding over their paid ads through Facebook and Google because they were gifting these people free products. And those people loved the fact that they were associated with the brand. They had lots of products being given to them. So they talked about it all the time. It was in all their social posts. And so it matched really well. So just for that, to scale from like, for example, with the jewelry brand from 30 to like a thousand or 10,000, is it a case of you sort of go in, find some of their most hardcore customers and say, all right, these are the people that you want to be promoting your brand. You should give them free product. Um, Yes, in a way. I mean, we don't really go out and do that for them. They are already there. Every brand, if you've got millions of customers, which most of the brands, if they're working with us, will have, um, you just give them the opportunity and people would put their hands up. If you think about your favorite brand, if your mm. brand said, hey, are you a creator? Would you like to have some free stuff and include us in your content? If you're that type of person, you put your hand up. You're like, yeah, definitely. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and and then also, you wouldn't do it for some brands, but you would do it for other brands. It may be that your brand is Patagonia, but if, uh, you know, uh, whatever, Purcell called you up and said, do you want to create content about your washing machine? You're not really interesting, but Patagonia says, do you want to create content of you climbing a mountain or something? You, and that's your jam. You're like, yeah, I'd love to be associated mm -hmm. with you. So it's about the brand just a certain bit giving the opportunity to their fans, to the, the customers who love them and saying, hey, we will, we would love to partner with 
some of you, you know, and that sum could be 10,000, but for a brand that size, mm. that's, that's, that's fine. Um, and then those people will say, yeah, I'd love to partner with you too. What's, what's in it for me? Oh, this is what we're thinking of giving you. Like, yeah, that sounds all right. I'm in. Or, yeah, yeah. no, actually, I've got 300,000 followers. Yeah. I, I'm worth more than that. Um, and then maybe that goes in a different direction. And there's yeah. other areas that those people live with those. And, and so what's happening is that the kind of the management side of this, because we had a lot of maturity with brands, with adverts and buying ads through TV and things like that. There's there's a lot of like uh, there's agencies and complexity and everyone's got that down to an art, but no one's watching TV. As mm-hmm. we said, they're now on social. So we're at this mat- like this maturity stage of social when actually this all needs to be grown up. You know, at the, the dual technology itself is it's about 10, 12 different tools, like individual point solutions that a brand would have, whether that's user generated content management or yeah. affiliate tracking or loyalty platform. We do that all under one roof so that you can just have one platform that can orchestrate those things. And, and, and because of that, you can build a much richer relationship with that person. Even if that person is a very normal person and there's 100,000 of them, it feels real and it feels one-to-one and personalized for them. And that's what makes them go out and become mm. a bigger, deeper advocate for the brand that they love. I, I do, uh, were you gonna, no, go ahead. I was gonna say, I do wanna dive a little bit deeper into the, uh, into the content cycle, but I think uh, just to sort of circle back to that, for now, I just wanna sort of go back to the beginning in terms of how you started Dual in the kind of early days of that. So sort of how did that come about and what were you doing before? Um, so the company came out of a, a gaming studio that we'd um, that my, my co-founder and I um, had been running relatively unsuccessfully, actually, as it turned out. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, what kind of games? It was more, more, more on the apps, kind of okay. gamified yeah. apps. And the, the, the science of kind of apps and virality and the way that you get someone to tell other people and share about it, it it's a real real science in that kind of silicon valley ilk. people are measuring it and optimizing it and really know what is driving that um that the viral factor that is if i get one person to get this product that person will tell on average 0.3 people so yeah. therefore you've got a machine of growth um and then optimize the hell out of it and then I'd previously to that, I'd, I'd done, I'd organized a lot of expeditions and, and done sort of large scale PR and had worked and advised a, a lot of brands. And I was like, hang on a second. As I got learned the depth of this, um, this kind of gamification and viral, viral marketing um, science, I was realizing that the biggest people who should be involved in this are brands, consumer brands. And none of them knew any of this. It was it was just really far removed. Everyone was just working on optimizing and spending as much money mm. on their ads. And so the two things happen is that one, this is A, really interesting that they don't know. And, and two, that um, actually I buy most of my things because of a recommendation for a friend. I can't remember yeah. buying anything because of an ad, yet 90 odd percent of budgets are spent on ads. There's that, that needs to be turned on its head. So what if we take some of that budget and we used it to recognize and incentivize the people who are actually driving the, the growth, the people, the humans, be that a customer in the pub telling another customer or an influencer with 100,000 followers. It's the same thing. It's still a person who loves the yeah. brand telling people about something that they love. And we do it all day long. Every one of us does that. If we could actually use that budget to do that, not only would that take a chunk of a budget away from Zuckerberg, who uh, at the time that Cambridge Analytica had come out, Trump yeah, had happened, yeah, <laughs> Brexit, yeah, yeah, yeah. it was like, hang on, let's find an alternative because otherwise this is not great. Um, and then, but also it felt like this is something that was a much more important work to be done because the brands who understood how you can get um, a person to talk about your, your brand, like worrying about, most brands are obsessed about getting someone to buy a thing. But the top percent, top one, two percent of brands, your Jim Sharks, your Patagonias, your Lululemons of the world, they're obsessed about what happens next, about the relationship you build, about the remarkable experience that they get. So that person feels compelled to remark upon you as a brand to their to their network, to their peers, to their followers, whoever that may be. Um, and those brands also happen to be coinciding with brands who align with the values generally brands who care about the world, who care about the environment, who care about doing a good job and caring rather than the short term, you know, profit reports that they give out in their in their warnings about much more long term growth. And it, it felt that this was a, the difference maker in terms of great companies that could have a great effect on the world. Um, and so much of the problems that we see from global warming to to the way that things are manufactured tend to come from short termism about people who are just looking at right let's just get that sale let's get that sale but if brands knew that if they cared a little bit more and if they looked a little bit longer term they'd get word of mouth and word of mouth is not only free but it's exponential and it will outperform um, the linear paid approach like 
well exponentially there's <laughs> not yeah, two yeah. to one ten so mm -hmm. in, in that sort of sense and so if we just were able to ma manage it to track it and measure it so it could become something that was predictable just like you do with buying an ad then actually you would be able to arm um, those brands to go into battle against the investors or the the board who are saying yes yeah, just buy ads just do yeah, the short yeah. term now don't worry about the experience you know let's go manufacture this over yeah. child labor over here you know you know no one will notice yeah, yeah, so. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, it, and it kind of really comes down to it so so that was the reason why we started the business i think and, I, I yeah go on go on i was just going to say so when you when you started and you were going out and trying to procure clients how difficult was it to actually educate them on that alternative approach um super hard uh, pre-covid um we're going out and saying hey you've got a community of people let's help let's build a proper community that you own and they're like i've got a community i've got an instagram following of you know five hundred thousand people like that's my community it's like it's not really it's zuckerberg's community mm. uh, and right now he is restricting your access to that and they're like yeah that's true but it's like would you like to own your own community and they're like yeah not really <laughs> okay <laughs> no one cared like quite frankly no no one cared um everyone's like what's advocacy doesn't really mean anything um but there was a real sort of step change that happened in COVID because like brands that had built uh, a great community, as soon as COVID happened, they invested in it. They stopped trying to push flog sales and discounts. They weren't like, hey guys, how you doing? You know, like mm -hmm. that, that, that mindset. Yeah, yeah. And you, you've, you've all followed them on social media. They're like, yeah, we've, we've kind of get together and things like that. But that's just, I, I think that was one of those things that I just like, I just found that really corny. I like brands that care. I actually feel like I'm quite specific with the brands that I, use because i only like brands that care but i did feel like in the pandemic when like i don't know my like my car insurance company is emailing me being like don't forget to wash your hands i'm like who the fuck are you like what you're my insurance company like when brands really care like the ones that do have sustainable agendas and environmental agendas i think that really helps but do you think there's a line of like companies pretending to be authentic and people a little bit too blatantly oh yeah 100 percent. but it was the ones that authentically did care that you sort of you mm. sensed it if, if you think of someone like Finisterre like putting on gigs on the, that people could stream into from their bedrooms and, mm. and, and like talks and things like that there was no way that they weren't trying to push a money-making agenda on it and, and um, there, there were countless other examples of brands that did that really really well and then yeah. there were other brands who were kind of care washing I don't know if that's a term but you know what I mean like, it is now to, I like that I'm using <laughs> to try try and allow that um, to happen so yeah there's definitely a, a difference but we know it you know when like Tesco's come in and say yeah we really care we're, we're all yeah. about that it's like, just, what it's you and however many yeah. hundred thousand people yeah like, no. you're not a per I hate that when they personify something yeah like on, the, on social media and stuff you're not like on Twitter's you'll see like companies like I don't know Tesco or whoever where it's like it's Friday I know we'll be having a Prosecco will you and it's like you're a, you're a not you're a machine you're a corporate machine you know <laughs> and, it, and you and, and you sniff through it right so that's that's the point is that it doesn't really matter whatever they say because you know it's bollocks but then yeah. some people are like yeah, generally you, you you probably are smashing the prosecco, right? Mm. I get that. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, <laughs> I can yeah, see yeah, that's yeah, going yeah. on. So it, that the, the difference between the brands that had done that really well is that they everyone stopped spending money on ads at the beginning of COVID, right? and and that happened at the same time. And then one of two things happened is their revenue started to continue to grow as their their community got more involved, deeper and deeper, because you care about the small number of brands you care about, and you don't care about the insurance companies. And then the other companies that had been spending their way to growth, had been spending their way to to revenue, to, to making sales, but not actual brand value, their brand drop value dropped massively. Mm. Um, particularly that first generation of D2C brands that had never built brand. They yeah. built uh, a sales machine that was optimized to hell, stop spending, brand revenue just goes off a cliff. The other guys, they stopped clever spending and their revenue went up mm. and you got so many of these d2c success stories that went really they were like gangbusters during covid because they were just like banging at the right time and it was all down to the community and it was those brands that are now thinking well our th our, our whole piece is advocacy this is this is what works for us these people these communities that like, get them to that build up the advocacy from those and it builds growth for us and so the market shifted and actually the word community, the word advocacy started appearing on pretty much every brand's list uh, lips. And we were fortunate enough that we'd been the one banging the door yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 like yeah. three years previously. No, I think I spoke to a guy about <laughs> yeah, it. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. So tell me any of the community. I told him to fuck off. Of course. Like, <laughs> and so they, they, then we'd then have those conversations with those, those brands. And the, the, the ball started moving. I mean, we had a terrible 2020. Like our yeah. product came out, actually the platform came out in 2020. 
um and we were right in the line we had to borrow money okay. and everything like that to, to keep the company going we, we fortunately weren't didn't have to get rid of any we could we could hold everyone out but then 2021 the sort of tide changed and in in 2022 into 23 we've been growing very quickly you know um yeah. multiple hundred percent uh, yeah. year on year growth and 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 that is due to the market change and us lucky enough having built a platform for the right time but at the wrong time yeah, <laughs> so yeah at the yeah, right yeah, time got there, well, on the communities there. thing that you mentioned i i really like the article that you wrote on uh, on rented communities versus self-owned and i really like that and i wanted to ask i wrote a note on it specifically where i put um i wanted to know what your thoughts were on things like substack and patreon and your own website and things like that because those are obviously still they feel more personal but they are still technically on someone else's platform um and then as a sort of second tie into that what about things like youtube because Obviously, YouTube isn't something as out of your hands as like a TV show on a network that you don't own, but it is still hosted on a platform that isn't yours. Um, but then no one's going to start. I mean, maybe maybe they will, but I don't think anyone's going to start making a website and putting videos on a website for them to watch that's on their own website mm. because YouTube's just too convenient, I feel like. Um, so I'm curious to know what you think about that and how that's going to change and where it's at now. Well, a, a lot of... I'm not saying brands, a lot of content is gated um, and paid for on people's websites, but which is high value content. Um, so courses and, and things like that. Sure. So people do do host that. And then a lot of B2B content is pushed towards their own website um, because it's also supposedly high value in, in that sense. So I think that there is there is that happening. The, the approach of content is that the more people know and respect you I, I think that's what i love about something like patreon patreon is like most of the content is put out for free and the stuff that is held back mm. is not actually the best content but it's the extra 10 percent that that 10 top 10 percent wants mm. it's the thing that brings them closer to the creator in a way that other people can't it's the fact that they get a, a closed um Geneva chat group or something like that where they can actually have a conversation and maybe see the, their favorite creator respond and interact and maybe even talk to them directly in some way shape or form that is so important to a very small number of people who would pay quite a lot of money for yeah. it and for the casual viewer the 95 99% of other people they get to consume the content mm. and I love that and it's like a complete upheaval and it's an entirely upside down business model and the classic media model of well pre-internet the newspapers and, and and things like that where you would pay access to it and then you get the content and so I, th I think that the era of substack and patreon amazing for that um, of real community building of, of um, engagement is powerful but you're also going to find that a lot of creators are moving from one one platform to another platform and, and it comes down to money as we were saying yeah. earlier about the relationships that they're getting with brands and if youtube isn't paying as much as tiktok in terms of ads or they can't get the brand placements on whichever platform they're moving they're moving mm. their audiences with them um and therefore the brands themselves have to follow and they they are at kind of the behest of these these creators to try and try and do that so um yeah it, it's no no one owns any of these social platforms well obviously some people own the platforms yeah. but no one owns their content when they're on there and therefore they don't own their audiences and there, there are horrors horror stories of people losing them after yeah. they build, build yeah, it yeah, yeah. but uh, really that they also have built an audience in a way that they would never have had previously had it not been for those platforms. So mm. it's quite a catch-22 in, in, in terms of I would be uncomfortable if that was the only thing that put bread on my my table, but yeah. also probably thankful if it was putting some pretty sweet... Some good bread. Uh, yeah. Some good <laughs> bread on there. Yeah, 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 yeah <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. Um, how, how does someone actually go about building a community then right at the start? If you, I mean, I know it's a relatively sweeping statement because it will vary industry to industry and sector to sector, but if you had to say a brand, a company starting now, how do they actually build that? community from right, right from the start um i i think there's a i think it comes down to the first principle of of really deeply building for a very niche group of people and it's not dissimilar to the patreon example of if you're building everything for that one percent and you know what they like then you're probably going to get it right and then you're also probably going to find a whole bunch of other people that also like it but it allows you to be really really focused and if you think about it like we work with quite a lot of outdoor brands so someone like rab so the largest outdoor brand in in the uk they um they make amazing like outdoor clothes for climbing mountains and they, they make these all-in-one jackets for going to the north pole in uh, it's insane and you know you do you really want to spend a thousand pounds on a jacket like generally no but if you went to yeah. the north pole it's yeah, exactly yeah. what you want right <laughs> yeah, <that's true. laughs> however they make most of their money selling jackets 
to people to put over their suit to keep them warm in the mm. uh, you know frozen food aisle or waitrose right that's like the uh, that's actually what these these super highly technical products are being used for but the brand is the brand is about being on top of the mountain the brand is about so much more than than actually the <laughs> keeping warm in the frozen yeah, food aisle yeah. and yeah. and and it's that sort of that mindset of building and building for a very narrow group of people, proper mountaineers, proper climbers. And then you also have tons of other people that that do it. They will always build for those climbers, but the actual revenue comes from elsewhere. And I think that's that's the same because brands, particularly in today, brands and communities, they're synonymous. They're basically yeah. the same thing. Um, we've personified the majority of these brands. A lot of the, the greatest brands, greatest modern brands are coming out. They almost always have a very well-known founder figurehead who is the voice of the brand that we work with charlotte tilbury for example perfect i mean it's literally her name on it monica vinita has been another one um these are great brands who are personified by their founder and and the, the brand and the product is the and the person are merged in this really interesting way that hasn't happened a huge amount and then they have a voice a direct channel to their customers in a way that they never previously had um, they had it like through social media that previously there was none of that. You used to have to sell it to Tesco's or Woolworths and mm, they yeah. would be your voice unless you bought some ads to kind of tell people third party to go to Woolworths mm. to buy your product. Now it's about direct consumer. Everything is evolving in that sense. So community had never been a thing for brands because they never had a direct relationship. But now it is. Now they have these direct relationships. So now brand building, community community building and brand building are the same. And so the brands that have done it well to answer your question are those brands that have understood exactly who their customer is really deeply and solved a problem or built a, built a product exactly for a person that says, this speaks to me in a mm. way that nothing else does. This is my look. This is my vibe. These are my people, whatever it may be. And I love that. And then they get close to that. And then they are getting closer to that brand. And it's, I think, where it is confusing the word community and community building is generally a community is you know a group of people talking to each other yet brand building and community building those people don't really want to talk to each other mm. like if you think of your favorite brand if if, so, if i said oh james my, my neighbor also likes that brand should i connect you so you can go for a drink like you're like not really yeah, why yeah. do i <laughs> that sounds yeah. a bit weird right yeah, yeah, yeah. um and I, I, that's a problem that a lot of brands expect is going to happen i think people care to talk to it they don't they care about the brand mm. so it is a weird use the word the word community does mean a lot of different things but generally when you're thinking about the core bit of brand building it's about getting down to those niche it's un deeply understanding them and the way that they deeply understand them is to talk to them ask them questions the number of um, we run a lot of masterclasses for for um, brand builders and founders, and I asked them when was the last time you picked up the phone and called a customer, and you know mm. probably asked hundreds and hundreds of people this, and had about two people pick, put their hand up ever. Yeah. Um, it really uh, sticks out. Like I mm. I bought a, I bought something from a website called Rise and Fall the other day, and the founder emailed me within about an hour of me ordering off that website to say, oh, can you just tell me how you came across the business? What you know, let me know what you think of the product. And mm. that for some reason that's just always stuck in my head because it's as you say, it's that direct line of communication to the business itself and the brand exactly and now you are telling us and all the people listening to it and actually for yeah. that one email he's had how much reach how many people are going to go out there and buy that product yeah. now yeah. It, it's and word of mouth is that one of the best ways of getting word of mouth is to allow a person to feel like they own a bit of that story mm. so that they tell it as if it's their own because it's all about ego at the end of the day that's why we yeah. tell any stories so if you can give them a thing that they said oh which color should we release next year and they said well uh, you know i really like the blue one and then we're like oh great thanks you said you really like the blue one we actually made the blue one you're like, oh. you tell your mates like oh, yeah check out that brand yeah the, the blue's the best one yeah, 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 yeah. I, I wanted to ask on um uh what your thoughts were on lush's decision to go off socials um because i think that's a really telling point uh, and i think it sort of touched on what i said around the beginning of the interview about people getting a little bit tired of the content cycle and it feeling a little bit oversaturated and a little bit uh less authentic and uh and i think a brand as big as lush making a choice to be like you know what we're not playing the algorithm game anymore like we make great products no one makes products like us you know where we are come find us i really respect that but it's obviously quite a controversial decision and i'd love to hear your expertise on it well i love it but is that last thing you said uh you know where we are come find us right it's all right for lush to do that airbnb did True. for did um, a similar thing recently where they turned off all their paid media um, and they've just reported uh, $1.6 billion profitability, like one of the few consumer really? companies that did that because they turned off um, their, yeah, they turned off all this ad and spend 
and they still managed to grow yeah. and they were infinitely much, much more profitable. Um, <laughs> but I feel like you can do that, as you say, at that level, you yeah. can do that. You can do that if you're Airbnb. Yeah. So there's a whole bunch of people who are struggling who've got a brand that's doing you know a million dollars rev- revenue. Like, I'm gonna turn off all my spend. Yeah, Airbnb can do it. It's like, no one knows who you are. Yeah. yeah. Every, like, Airbnb is a verb. <laughs> yeah, that's so true. <laughs> that's the best way to put it. That that's true. so true. Yeah. So like, <laughs> it, there's no like it's it's a it's a so lush is lush is similar not not even at the same extent yeah. so it's it's okay for them to turn it off and people are like yeah it was power to the people like Patagonia doing the same thing because the Patagonia right mm. um they're able to do that I think it's really hard to do that otherwise I think there's uh, I was kind of mixing things you sort of talked about just coming off social generally there's also coming off paid social like coming off paying for ads and I think that if you're really good at the social side of things and you can get your community to talk about you, then you don't need the paid ads. Um, that's easier said than done. Your own content, only a one or two percent of people will ever see unless it's an unbelievable piece that's super high value and a lot of people share it. But other people's content that they make about you, that is actually where it's much more much more likely to hit into people's feeds in the algorithm or whatever that may be. So if you're able to get that bit right, which is I mean, obviously, I'm super biased, right? <laughs> That's literally what we get. We we power for our brands, but it, we have seen that with brands who are able to do that and track it, and it becomes you know as as big a channel as they're paid. It, I'd rarely recommend a brand turns off their paid, and it's like mm. us or them. It's 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 us and them. Mm. Um, you know, how do you get your advocates and your paid? And in fact, a lot of our brands use paid to acquire more advocates, so they use. Yeah. Uh, Instagram ads to target their own audience on Instagram to say, hey, we've got a program. Would you like to be a brand ambassador? Which is incredibly meta, no pun intended, yeah. um, <laughs> to, yeah. to, to, to do that. So yeah, it's, a, it's, it's quite an interesting phase. And one of the other things is that no one knows what's going on, right? This, this whole space of building brands directly, this community building, it feels like it's been around. We all feel quite familiar with it, but it's, it's only been around for, I mean, a decade. Mm. The idea of an influencer only came out 2016, 2017, something like that. Um, and now it's, oh, yeah, of course, they're influencers, right? I know how to do that. It's like, it was evolving. It's changing. It's it's like, it's been such such a new space that it's constantly innovation. And there's always an opportunity for a brand to do it well and to do it differently. Um, and for a brand to be started up in someone's bedroom and to whip up a Shopify site um, and to start trading with a really, really short period of time is, is just also amazing. And, and so it's incredibly competitive, but which is why the cost of acquisition costs so much because there's so many players yeah. in it. But also it means that anyone can play this game and that, that kind of democratization of it is is also really cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Super cool. I can tell you get really excited talking about this. Yeah. yeah. I, I can just, I can see, I can <laughs> yeah. see, I don't know if you have that as Completely. well. But I can That's really why I'm so see, in it. I love branding too. So I can I'm really see like, a passion for it when you talk about it. So yeah. I just wanted to touch on kind of where that passion came from and how you realized you had a, a passion for this, for this area. I'm just a massive nerd. Uh, like, oh um, yeah, dude. <laughs> Hell yeah. It's bad for the nerds, dude. It's bad for the nerds. Like, I have always been a, a massive nerd, and um, it, uh, like, I've always loved the bre- Like, for me, it's always been outdoor sports and, and adventure sports, whether that's mountain biking or whitewater kayaking or snowboard or anything like that. Those were the sports that I was obsessed about when I was a teenager, and. The brands that facilitated those sports, the sponsored the athletes to be full time going out and creating content and doing those sports, they were just incredible to me that that could be a thing. And I, I was then really into those brands. I you know remember um, having Quicksilver stickers and, and Animal stickers. You remember back yeah, in that yeah, era, yeah. right? And as well as bike brands and things like that. And it was just like yeah, they were the they 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 were the vessel. For my passion in many ways and they still are like for every for a lot of people's passions the sports that the the if you're if you're passionate about sports that was mine but if you're passionate about makeup or, or, or jewelry or fashion of which there are very very many number of people the brands are the machines that, that that are kind of a part of allowing that to happen um so that that's kind of where it came from i mean i've always been like I said, on the nerdier side of things, like you know, started building websites when when I was when I was a kid, and and uh, you would often think a lot of the engineering mindset is uh, about oh okay, well like if I can measure if I can measure that I paid this amount of money and then you bought a product and I can track it, so therefore this is the way it should be. But actually, for me, the beauty in brand building is and and when we were able to see it when we were looking at it from an app's perspective is that it is measurable and it's previously been this mythical thing it's just like oh yeah like there's the quote of 
um, 50% of all, all marketing works. Problem is, I don't know which 50%. Um, <laughs> like, if, particularly pre-direct-to-consumer brands, and, and that was a quote from, from Pepsi, uh, who don't have a direct-to-consumer channel. Um, that Before that, there was no way of knowing it. But now there is. Now we can measure so much of these different parts of it, yet still very very little investment relatively done is, is, is it investing in brand and community building and the people who are driving that business forward. And so that for me, that's just something which has made total sense because you can take the nerdy and the software side of things. I've, I've, I've always worked in software and, and, and worked for a SaaS company whilst I was still at uni and, and mm. things like that. So I've got that, that sort of DNA in me, but then there's this sort of flighty brand thing. I never thought the two of those passions would meet and and I'd never planned it when we started Jewel. It, it just somehow kind of kind mm. of merged in this way, and it sort of came yeah. out for it. And and I'm fired up about what I do. I love what I do, and and I and I, 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 I out, yeah. out nerd people. Hey guys, I just wanted to take a second to talk about our sponsor for this episode, Furniture Box. Furniture Box is an online furniture retailer that makes awesome products for everywhere from your bedroom to your office. Now we actually had Monty and Dan, the co-founders, on our show. That's how we met. We loved their story and we hung out with them afterwards and we knew that we wanted to work with them. And here's the thing. One of the biggest issues I have whenever I've ordered furniture in the past is that certain big name furniture companies, not naming any names, will charge you a fairly large fee for delivery. And even then that delivery usually takes a few days, if not longer. With Furniture Box, not only do they offer free next day delivery, but they're now planning on extending their delivery cutoff even more so that you can literally order a dining set as late as 8 p.m. and be eating dinner on it the next day. So to put it simply, there's no one in the UK furniture scene that's doing anything like what they're doing. And we're thrilled to have them as our sponsor so click the link in the description and check them out now back to the episode i, I wanted to <laughs> ask about um about standing out because uh i feel like um one of the biggest issues is as i said because obviously content is the main way and everyone's making content uh it's really difficult to find a way to on one hand stand out from the competition but on the other hand you know it's that age-old thing of you can't reinvent the wheel you know you kind of the best thing is to clone copy and then eventually do your own thing don't try and do everything completely from scratch or whatever um and even like in our niche you know as, as james and i have talked about you know it's like podcasts are huge right now interview podcasts are huge and it, it feels like everyone's doing the same formula which is also what we're doing which is you know you have an episode you have maybe a highlight or two and then you make a short form clip you also get the captions on it you know highlight the odd important word put a bit of music under it and it feels like everyone's doing that. So in a world where that is just the standard and there's a million podcasts, how do you stand out? Sort of a bit of free branding advice for us, but I am also asking for like for content creators in general. Um, I, I've been thinking a lot about this recently because we have our own podcast. It's Building Brand Advocacy. You want to search that on <laughs> Apple Podcast? Plug um, it away, maybe plug it away. <laughs> um, but so so we, when we started the podcast, it, it was a similar format. It still is a similar format of getting, the idea is get great build, brand builders on and, and interview them and ask them about it. But it, yeah, it, it started to turn out that outside of the podcast we do a lot of courses we do we do um uh, a lot of content creation but with it behind closed doors like workshopping um for for you know some of the biggest brands in the world and uh, we we will work with cmos of brands that you're probably wearing or like t right now all day long and they're listening to us about our advice in terms of of what what they should do in terms of growing their brand in this new world which even if they've got 25 years of experience it's still quite new to them and, and we're, we're lucky enough to to have a seat at that table, which is which is awesome. And it's starting to realize that we're trying to pull in this content from other people. And we've got some amazing interviews of people who are really insightful. Um, we had the CMO of Levi's on, for example, last week, and um, she's just an incredible brand builder. And what we're learning from her was great. But there's also a lot of opportunity for creating content in a niche for the people that we know know really well, and those are our customers. And so we're like, well, why are we building this for a high level idea of, hey, anyone who's into marketing, listen to this. We're like, we need to build it for a real niche, for the people who we know are building programs of advocates, communities, like to grow consumer, D2C consumer brands, yeah. you know, of a certain, of a decent size. Yeah, it's, it's a real niche, but we realize that actually, if we aren't creating content specifically for them, we're kind of creating content for no one. And so we're changing it entirely so that it's going to be, well, what do they need to know? We know that they come to us for masterclasses on very niche topics. We bring in different people in the team, whether that's about 
uh, recruitment or the psychology of incentives yeah. or if it's about different platforms like Pinterest for example we just did a piece of content on which which I know nothing about and it blew my mind it's, it's not just for mm. planning your wedding and your living room it's, yeah. <laughs> it's like yeah. this unbelievable content discovery factory and, and from from a brand's perspective there are no better commercializable platforms than Pinterest I didn't really understand it because I'm not on it but actually we've got amazing strategists on our team Verity who came in and taught us about that so it's like okay well why don't we actually kind of have our in-house team creating content that's just been pushed out that's just educational and so the idea is that the podcast is not a show it is a channel if you think of it like you have multiple if you're screaming through if you're really into UK history you'll go to the UK history yeah. channel or whatever it's called yeah. um, and you don't know that you're going to see something on Churchill or something on you know the king of or, or, or the Saxon times or whatever the case is but if you're you're into the niche you're into the channel the vertical the different shows that you get are varied so um, that's kind of the approach that we're taking for it from a um, from a kind of content perspective uh, still interviewing amazing founders but then shifting out to be like well let's just start doing educational pieces let's just do like a yeah. 20 minute podcast on here's how you do x or here is some learning from this or let's look at a brand that we love and say these this is why lululemon are so good at what lululemon do and then break that down all the different things from a from an advocacy perspective and just go really geeky on it so i don't think that answers your question um yeah. <laughs> but it's sort of just like from our side of things as well how how do you go or how do businesses go about actually finding that that customer or who their customer is then because it sounds like that's really the the first part that you actually need to figure out so you can understand who you're kind of catering to so how do brands understand exactly who their customer is it's, it's a good question it, it comes down to just just knowing them and, and making a space to have the conversation the email that um, that guy sends you from that brand um picking up the phone you, generally you'll have a number um of someone to help with deliveries so, hi you just bought from me bit weird sorry but <laughs> yeah who are you? Why did you buy it? Stands it? out. It does stand, stand out. It stands out. And then yeah. most people are like, oh, I don't know. I think I was searching the internet. Like, okay, what were you searching? I'm not sure. I can't remember. It's just like, well, what were you trying to buy at the time? Oh, I was trying to buy a coat. Okay, cool. So what did you search for for the coat? Oh, well, I actually searched for black long leather jackets or whatever. People will remember, but they often need to be prodded a couple of times. Um, and then you can just pull in huge amounts of information. You're like, well, what, what were you doing at the time? What was going on? Were you watching TV at the time? Were you are you you were watching football? Okay, cool. What's going on? Was you this and you throw them back into the moment in the room, and then they are like they'll bring them back into the mindset that meant that they stumbled and made a decision to purchase from you, and that is the magic. That if you can bottle that, you can mm. then continue to roll it out to find people who look and smell just like them. And so if you you hear the same thing, you do ten calls and you hear the same thing seven times, like that's what you do. You do nothing other than that. That's mm. the most important thing. All the other shit you need to cancel because most of the stuff that we do is irrelevant. But if you're getting that feedback from a person, you focus and double down on that. And that is how you deeply understand who your customer is. And if you then show up with something which deeply understands them and it solves their problem as a solution, and whether that's a product or a piece of software or, or, or a podcast or whatever it is, then you will find that product market fit, if, yeah. if you will. Um, and those people will... A, consume it, listen to it, wear it, whatever the case is. And B, tell the people that they know who would find it valuable as well. And we tell, diff we don't tell everyone we know about certain things, but like I'll tell, I've got a group of people that I'll tell about a really niche software as a service tool. I've got other people that I'll tell about, you know, a bike thing. I go riding with, we have different groups within our own network. We don't tell everyone everything, but we, we do get very tactical with it. And those people, the more niche it feels that your solution is to them, the more niche the word of mouth they'll do to that one person mm. who, who is exact, who they know would love it. And that one person is all you need to get that viral machine just like exploding mm. in exponential growth. What's your favorite brand and why? Oh, so my, my answer to this is it's Red Bull. Right. Um, and the reason why I love Red Bull, similar to what I was saying earlier about the idea that um, when you're into sports and stuff, into like sports, I, I, I was thinking yeah, you were going to say Red Bull. They, 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 they facilitate like a dude jumping out of a balloon out of space. Right. <laughs> like there's some really cool things that they do. And, and every great sportsman and woman um, tends to have a Red Bull helmet on. That's how it works. And so um, th that's incredible. But the reason why I love that is because I think it's awful stuff and I don't drink it. And, and that is what, <laughs> as, a, as a brand building nerd, like the, this is the stuff that I geek out on. So the fact that I, I hate the product and I can still love the brand is, is like doubly good. So that's, 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 that's my go-to answer. That's a great answer. Because I was going to ask you about that and be like, do you think those two, it's like when people say, can you separate the art from the artist and all that kind of thing? Yeah. Well, what's yours? <sighs> Mine's a really tricky one. 
I'm really like particular with stuff. I do like um. Oh, it's really hard to say. I I do I do like Apple products. I do like Apple products. I don't like the stuff that the company does, and I and I wish I didn't like Apple products. But I really just like. I was a really big fan of, like Steve Jobs and stuff. I've you know I've, I've read a lot about him and I've watched the movies and stuff and I found him a very inspiring figure. And I think that the seamlessness of them and the usability of them and i'm smiling even as i'm talking about it which i hate in a way <laughs> but it's just they're also they're beautiful but they're practical and they're seamless and they just feel i feel like i've got potential at my fingertips when i'm on an iphone or a macbook or something which just feels different to when i hold my friends like androids for example and i don't even really know why because i've had android i mean this is the age-old iphone android thing right brainwashed basically I'm maybe it is like, no, maybe it is but I've, I've but i've had like I mean, I've spoken to friends who love their Androids and uh, and then they'll say, and I never do the whole, you need to get a knife. I don't even say shit about it, but they will be like, you fucking cheat with your eye. You know, this one actually has a processor that can fuck it. And I'm like, I don't give a fuck. I don't care at all. Cause this one is just, it just feels nice in my hand and it is nice with my fingers and it works and it's just nice and it just works. And I like it. And that's the only most raw way I can say it. I mean, potentially at your fingertips. I mean, you should literally go and get a job there. That sounds amazing. <laughs> yeah. like, like they Sold. Will, they're going to pay yeah. like some agency 10 million bucks to come up with something worse than that. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Give it to me. I'm a comedian and I need the money. <laughs> what about, what's your favorite brand? Uh, it's tricky. I mean, I really like, I really like Grenade, actually. Which is, a, I know you, I know you really like Grenade. I should, yeah, well. I like Grenade as well. I really like Grenade. Yeah. I feel like I have, I, I just, I love the products that they sell. I feel like they're very authentic. You know exactly what you're getting when you're buying something from Grenade. Mm. It's healthy. It's good for you. And I think I just, uh, yeah, I, I, I like I like it for that reason. I just, it's my go-to for, for anything related to, to health, like protein or protein powder, protein bars, that sort of thing. Um, so, yeah. I it's would a, say, it's I would say Grenade. It's a great brand. But I'm like you. I'm a, I'm a massive marketing nerd and a branding nerd. And I've watched so many YouTube videos of like how this company branded themselves in like 1975. And I'm like, how? And then it's like, well, they actually did this little campaign where they sent out things in the newspapers or whatever. <laughs> I geek so hard on that stuff. Um, and I know that there's, I'm going to think of a brand later and I'll be like, I should have said that brand. Obviously that brand, because I think about them all the time. But it is such an interesting thing because we do feel so attached. And I've noticed that as I've gotten older and more conscious as a consumer... I do tend to lean more towards brands where they have got more of a message behind them. I do like brands that use like sustainable packaging and they do less harm. And I, I am willing to pay more if I know that it, things are like ethically sourced, for example. And I don't, per, I don't really buy stuff. I'm quite like minimal in terms of as a consumer, but I'm happy to make that compromise that I'd rather buy less and buy something that's a bit more ethical than, than to buy, you know, more or whatever. And, and, and you're not alone. And, and I think that kind of comes down to that, that sort of like core ethos, that purpose around showing that there's a better way to build a business is that the brands that, that are doing that they're making more money mm. uh, and at the, they're, at the end of the day that's why you start a business and um they are they, they are they've been doing so a lot of them been doing it for years and 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 they've been ethical and now it's hot they're doing really really well mm. and um it, it is it, like the more that you care the better you are for the world incidentally the more that people care about they at you and the more they tell other people because they care about you and mm. then the more you grow and you sell like um patagonia being another one if you look at the sales growth of them since the less they do the marketing the the better that they do um it, it's a really hard place now though because we, we knew a brand um uh that was an incredible brand and cared more than anything else from the first cotton brands out there and um organic cotton brands out there and they became commoditized because then mm. everyone started doing Marks and Spencer started selling. Yeah. And and actually, then they were like, hey, but we're even more green and actually getting more militant about your greenness mm. actually wasn't enough of a differentiator and they unfortunately went under. And, and um, it does make it, you realize that you've got to be current, you've got to keep innovating because mm. that is now a permission to play. It's now table stakes for the brands that we talk to. Um, and they are all in that space. So now what is it that makes you better? It's not going to be that you can plant another tree because everyone's already planted all mm. the trees that you're going to do. Like, why can you care more about that customer? How do you fit that mold of what they want? How do you show that you know their pains and their wants and their desires better than anyone else so that they continue coming back to you when they want to buy whatever widget mm. or item that they're selling? Do you have yeah. like a favorite brand story or like a favorite kind of or a brand that had like a kind of marketing golden nugget in terms of like how it came up? Like... Apple obviously has such a recognizable brand, you know, they don't do ads famously and 
you know mcdonald's bought the real estate under what they were doing all that kind of thing like do you have like that's the stuff that really gets me going yeah. like i find do you have any cool like i love this brand because they did this thing where they you know that stuff like that um there's a couple of ones like the uh, the word of mouth story what it is that made them viral um mm. and uh, i think gopro is a great example of that um because you'd watch someone do this insane thing um whatever it may be even a doc dog doing a cool trick or yeah, <laughs> whatever yeah. and you're like that is awesome and then you're like oh and you filmed that on the gopro and it always says gopro and you're like yeah. shows the thing filmed on a gopro and you're like I want one of those. Yeah, yeah, true. <laughs> and that's it. So that that I I find is fascinating because they their their product is the product. The product is the mechanic of the virality. It's, it's just like that one's really good. Um, and then there's other things that just spark conversation. Um, there's a, a great book uh, called Tort Triggers, and there's the idea of uh, there's some hotels that put like, co- cookies in the room, um, and everyone talks about the cookies. Uh, or the idea of when you go to Five Guys, they always put far too many chips in. They yes, do. I know. Yeah, they, yeah, do. Yeah, they do. And I love I know, that. I know. Yeah, exactly. And you then get a bag, and you're like, they're yeah. spilling over yeah. the cup. So many chips everywhere. That's this is so crazy. true. I love Five Guys. Yeah. Have you got a Five Guys? You've got yeah, so many chips. True. Yeah. And, and it's that type of thing, which is that it <laughs> so it, it does it doesn't it's not that much harder for them. Mm. Chips, chips doesn't cost anything really it's yeah. potatoes but that magic that gets that word of mouth going in there true one, one of the good the ones that i love is have you ever ordered anything from wiggle i haven't no. actually they no. always, there's always a little um haribo they send a little packet of haribo do they really yeah and you are oh, uh, yeah. haribo i okay. like haribo yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, something as well. simple as that simple sticks as out that. Okay, yeah it's really really good so yeah. i think every brand can can think about the journey and just be like where in this journey can i add magic yeah. Like, and you talk about the idea of it, yeah. a remarkable experiences and it's so remarkable I feel compelled to remark upon it some airlines do a phenomenal job of it in yeah. some cases some of them do a shit job of it yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and there's just opportunities across the board so follow the journey from the second they see a piece of content the way they consume it for, from the moment that they've ordered it on their website what can you do what emails come afterwards most of the time they're like oh, leave us a review no, mm. go on. How, would you recommend this to a friend? And mm. like, uh, like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, <laughs> you have to add. What, what value are you adding to yeah, their lives? Yeah, yeah. Most people are obsessed about selling, about the revenue, and they're obsessed about themselves and mm. what they can get out of it. And actually, yeah. if you were to switch that around and be like, I'm obsessing about the person and the experience that I can give to them, you will operate your business differently, and you will build a business that will grow exponentially. But what? Are, yeah, okay, go on, go on. Okay. no, no, no. I was going to say, what are some of the sort of most obvious or key slash fatal mistakes that you see? brand making trying to build a community or a customer base um i'd say apart from obviously not building for a very good niche or a lot of times building out into another area um this this is maybe a bit of a niche mistake but a lot of single product brands release a second product too early before they've really saturated the growth of where they are and where people will just like buy anything from them and they then split the attention like you do this and they do this hang on I'm a bit confused what do they do and then you end up splitting it and therefore you don't get someone says if you need widget a you should always go to this company which makes the best widget a type of thing because if you're they're not known for that one thing then it's harder for you to tell that story to someone else because they do loads of things mm. uh you should yeah, check them out it's not as interesting not as powerful and you're less likely to remember it and then be able mm. to google it later and it comes down to that if you want a phone case this is the company yeah, yeah. Phone case. exactly yeah. and if they start selling suitcases like we're in the case business like yeah. everyone starts bringing up the case study they read in you know they read a yeah, business yeah, yeah. school about like um the digital cameras and digital camera co- yeah. companies do it. it's not as interesting but brands have to reach a point of saturation within their really narrow niche before they can start moving out of that which is the case of where they start who they market to outside of it and also di- releasing different products so i suppose a follow-on question from that then would be when does a brand know that it's saturated that particular market and is ready to then expand into different avenues so i i think there's a there's a there's a couple of inflection points and I'm stealing this from the the private equity company Piper who invested and they they're like seven seventeen seventy so it's seven million seventeen million seventy million turnover okay. and there's an inflection point at each point I, I don't know what happens after seventeen or seventy but I do know that at seven million pounds which is about ten million dollars a company changes and it becomes a brand. And, it, and it's very hard and I'm sure there's a lot of people who are running brands who are less than $10 million would deeply disagree with me for this but I think until like a brand is uh, a brand is a symbol it is a fast track to a meaning for what does that mean so you see the Apple logo and you think uh, potential at my fingertips <laughs> <laughs> that was off the top people by the way that was completely off the top uh, and, uh, or you, you see 
Amazon's awful smile logo, which is terrible, ugly as hell, and cringy as hell, but you go, oh, yeah, cheap and efficient, right? And, yeah. and, it, and it means something to you from that. For a company, which is, let's take a, a fashion brand which sells T-shirts and trousers and dresses, T-shirts and we, we all have T-shirts and trousers and some of us have dresses and some of us are like, that, 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 that there is nothing that differentiates the, the product really apart from the brand. Um, but until they're at a stage where enough people are in there, they've got enough critical mass of, you know, I, I think that there's a, 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 a critical mass of true fans which says that they will buy literally anything that they do. You haven't quite got a brand yet. You're on your way to building a brand. You have a sales machine that is selling products, whatever it may be, but it's not a brand that if you were to release a completely radical different product, a core group of people will still yeah. buy it. Um, and I base, a, base my, my, this is my theory on it based on Kevin Kelly's essay of a thousand true fans yeah. of, of where you can, you know, you can make your living as a creator if a thousand people spend a hundred bucks mm. and you've got a, you know, you've got yourself a pretty good, good salary there. Um, that will pay you to continue creating. That's all you need. And that's actually a much more manageable idea to try and do that. So really deeply tying into that true fan mentality, which again, you can see the trend of what, what I'm talking about. Um, but actually, once you've got that, and I don't know whether it's a thousand or it's two thousand or whatever it is, but if you imagine to have a thousand true fans, you've probably that's what maybe one percent. Mm. Um, so you've had to have sold a hundred thousand thingies. Um, and what does that mean? Is a company that is doing however much revenue per year? It seems to be that if a brand makes it to ten million dollars, seven million pounds, they can continue growing. They start to actually build that brand, but there are far, far there were far fewer brands that actually make it to that stage mm. and they never do make it to that stage. And I, and I don't know why, but I, my my theory is that it's because they have reached that critical mass of fans that if they were to release a, they're a t-shirt company, but they release a vacuum cleaner tomorrow, a thousand people will buy it and mm -hmm. they know that they'll sell a thousand units and those thousand people then tell yeah. however many people and that machine can start ticking over. But I'd love to test it. I don't quite know if it. <laughs> I, th I think you made, you made something that I was just really got me thinking just then, which I thought was so... So, so insightful which is that you said um you, you said about how it's about the impression you have of the brand but it isn't necessarily a, a direct thing it's about a feeling that the brand gives you in a way where it's like you know if you think and, and i think that's so true like you know with um with apple you think expensive but really awesome mcdonald's you think delicious bad quality on a hangover on a hangover yeah, yeah, you know yeah. what i mean range rover cool car will break down a lot you know whatever <laughs> it might be you have these impressions of these brands. And I think it's, it is that thing where it, it's sort of just by experience and virtue of dealing with those brands and the experience you've had with them. And I think that's, it's sort of like, you know, with friends, how um, there are some friends where when you go to call them, you know kind of whether they're gonna answer or not. This friend normally answers his phone. This friend doesn't really answer his phone very much. This friend sometimes answers. And you kind of just have a feeling. Do you know what I'm talking about? I know, yeah, I know. And what it's mean. like, it's you not know know a mean. thing that you can really quantify, but it's just from the, all the amount of times you've called them over the years, you know. And I think that's kind of the same thing with branding. And that kind of just clicked for some reason when you were when you were describing it about how a, the, the attachment you have to a brand is the impression that you have on it, which isn't even necessarily something that has been described to you. It's about by, by virtue of your experience in dealing with that brand. Well, it, it's a promise of a service. Mm. Mm. Um, it is, I know that when I buy this product, I will get X. And that is what the brand means. And it's, it's, this, it's the symbol, it's the fast track that... Um, takes you to the own knowledge that they that you do that and and the reason why i like to to use amazon as as the example for this is because a their branding is terrible and brand and branding are completely different i've got no idea about branding and whether the aesthetics of a logo like not not a clue um you can just use ai for that now not not to cut you off but just on that because as i was walking here i've said that we said this this uh, i said this to james the other day I'm, I feel like I see this all over. You'll see like um, a shop on a high road and it will be like an accountancy firm and it will have the most dog shit branding. <laughs> I mean, you know, do you know the one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. What you know exactly about. what I'm talking about. <laughs> it will have the most dog shit branding, awful, garish like colors. The name will just be like accountancy services something. And yet they, w you know, they're paying rent somewhere in central London. They're clearly still in business and they've been there for years or whatever. You know, you see them all over and you're like, how when you've got half the world of marketing being like you need a cool logo you need an interesting name you need you need to have social media content you need to be talking to your customers and then you've got like john down the street who's got a shop that looks like it was made in 1987 who's like he's just pissed out his branding and he's clearly doing business and that's always baffled me was well, because so that's the difference so his his branding is crap 
his brand is probably amazing. I don't know John down the street. But <laughs> like, but, Shout out, John. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whoever you are. Yeah. John's accountant. So yeah. um, but, but like, if you think about what a brand is, it's, it's, it's your reputation. And he True. probably has a great reputation with a number of people. It's just like, I, I've got some accountancy problems. I, um, you know, I'm being sued. I was like, yeah. oh, you need to speak to John. Yeah. And, and that is how he gets I mean, the guy business. with the awful logo the guy with the awful logo yeah so so the difference between the branding and the brand is that so so amazon's branding crap awkward like cringy smile brand is actually amazing not because and, and what makes amazon great is because it's actually a pretty awful company i mean like it's human rights record is awful like mm. how do you think about all those things however as a proxy you see the amazon logo and it is um it is a proxy for cheap and fast and unbelievable customer experience and when you um you look at their brand values the number one thing is customer service customer we're obsessed we want to be the most customer obsessive Mm -hmm. company in the world is what they said bezos says um and that obsession comes down to it well what does a customer want do they want a pretty logo they probably don't care what the customer wants they want it to be cheap and they want it to be fast and delivered really easily. They don't have to worry about putting any of the details in. And they want to be able to make the decisions faster and easier than any any other way. So if you have to open up 3brand.com and compare their different things, yeah. well, you open Amazon and it has the stars. like that. They, I mean, it's been around, but they, they were the ones who popularized the, popularized the idea of stars and reviews. Mm. So you can make very fast, well, actually, um, social proof based decisions about whether a product is good or not. And so you don't have to agonize over it because with, with the decision fatigue that every person has every day is so much, so much that actually Amazon have just smashed it because mm. they deeply know that the customer is lazy and we are all lazy. And mm. probably uh, some people are really strong and they don't use Amazon, but for everyone else who's weak, we use yeah, it. Yeah. Of which I am one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, it, and I hate it and I hate myself every time I order yeah. something from Amazon, but oh, it's just easy. And, and that is why it's such a powerful brand because yeah. brand is reputation. It's yeah, not about the branding, it's true. about the reputation. And that's yeah. what they promise. That promise of that service is what you see when you see their logo. I mean, the most part, I mean, that is, I guess, the biggest testament to a brand. The most powerful brand is one where you hate it and you don't want to use it. And yet it's just so good that you have to. I mean, that is insanely powerful. Damn. It works. Just, uh, just briefly, because uh, I know we've got to wrap up really soon, but I really wanted to ask you, um, we mentioned AI earlier. What impact do you think because all of a sudden we're going to go off a cliff now it's going to get really depressing because we're all going to be out of work in the space of five years okay we okay. we talk about this all the time and we literally we talked about it right before you came and we were talking about this exact thing and i'm really curious to hear what you think about how it's going to impact your industry oh yeah um oh, i'm uh, yeah i'm kind of nerded out on this have built my own auto GP, gcp bot and various okay. things wow. on that like it's it's um yeah, I find it fascinating and incredibly exciting, and and it's just just the opportunity is terrifying. That if you don't move fast enough, you're going to miss it. Mm. Um, so as, you've taken if you can't beat him, join him approach. If you've already made a bot, yeah, I mean, hundred yeah. percent. Um, you have to like the the best way. If anyone is like, well, I don't know about this AI. I don't know if I can understand it. The best way you're going to understand it is start using it. Um, getting into it, using it for something, book your holiday, whatever it is. Just like start playing around with it, seeing its capabilities, because nobody knows the extent of its capabilities and how it can be used but it's all it's all up for grabs and that's really really exciting um and it's also incredibly terrifying um <laughs> I, and, and yes like, it is <laughs> i mean like i i personally believe that we're one step away from a massive global recession i yeah. think it can bring down so many different different elements from like automating out jobs that are paying taxes and the financial yeah. system could collapse. There are just so many different things that can and probably will go wrong yeah. um, in the short term because things are happening, but it is transformational. So I think that's like a more of a macro view. When, when you take it from a brand's perspective, I think surprisingly, I don't know how much it would change. Um, if you think about you wearing a product if you think fashion it's just quite a a, a straightforward one i Mm. I can't see that you wanting to buy a t-shirt is going to change radically and you buy a brand not for the sake of its ease in in most cases you buy you travel halfway across the city to go to a a shop 
where mm. you can go to Primark right next to you. So you're putting in the hard work. So it's not about automation, which is why you're making a purchase from All Saints versus Primark or whatever the case is. So I think the idea of a brand and is probably not going to change um, too much in the same way that everyone's like, oh, crypto is going to change. It's mm. just like, well, crypto is about decentralization and you know everyone having a, an ownership of it. And, and by its nature, a brand is the most centralized thing in the world mm. <laughs> because without the centralization of the brand and the promise of a service, you don't have a brand. And so it can't really be be decentralized. Well, yeah, because uh, it's funny, again, you say crypto. James and I had this exact conversation like a couple of hours ago. And uh, and I said the whole thing of, I think this is really going to make a, a pretty big difference to a lot of people's jobs and a lot of industries. And he said, well, yeah, everyone said about crypto too. And I said, yeah, but with crypto, you need adoption. You need what, you know, everyone in the world to use it. With AI, if you found a way to basically, I don't know, get your taxes done through a bot for 10, you know, one tenth the price, you don't need everyone else in the world to do it. You just need me next door to be like, you're getting one tenth the price, your taxes. Let me use that. And it's just way more accessible. That's true. No, that is very yeah, true. Because I mean, it, it, it may, you know, create a massive recession, not thousands and millions of people's jobs out, but it also might get rid of the need for lawyers. And I'm quite willing to take that risk. <laughs> I, amen to that. <laughs> amen to that. And I said that exact thing. It's like a mirror of the conversation. It is, like, it is exactly. Um, yeah. uh, the, other, the other side of it is, I think that a lot of the tasks that have been, been automated out, they're going to be automated out. And the content that people are going to consume is going to be automated and, and, and generally like poor quality you were talking about you've got to have this much the cadence mm. of it good content is always going to be good content mm. whether it and and whether it's done because someone is really good at prompting an ai or not like that actually matters less but good content is good content and we will seek out authenticity in the same way that we already seek out authenticity like, that's a very good point we we True. can listen to all of our music on spotify where we can have access every single song ever made instantly in a split second yet record sales are higher than they've ever been um because people want the feeling of the difficulty the authenticity of getting the vinyl out and putting it down mm. there because after you can get everything everything is not valuable you want to have the restriction of it and so i think authenticity the idea of a real person creating content a real person being an advocate for a service or a product i think that then becomes the only thing that matters mm. in a world of homogeny that will be done by the ai so i'm pretty like selfishly i think we're in a good place from an ai side of things um like from the company side of things but i'm absolutely fucking terrified for the rest of the world. lawyers watch you out know, until, until, what saying, until okay. that last yeah. thing that you said until that last sentence i was about to be like you've actually made me feel way better about it because you're right yeah. well then people will stand out and you're like but i mean ultimately and i'm fucking yeah, i'm yeah, absolutely yeah, breaking exactly. it yeah, yeah. um dude this has been such an amazing conversation yeah, awesome. man uh, i'm really? aware you have to go but thanks so much against your time um before you leave we like to ask every guest basically the same question um at the end of every episode which is if you could give one practical piece of advice to anyone who is either starting a business or has just started a business what would that piece of advice be so kind of less in the you know believe in yourself work hard angle and more in the kind of actionable uh something they can actually maybe put into play i i mean most of the bollocks you think you need to do you don't need to do so so i think the um the role of a founder they have one job and one job only and that is to find product market fit um, so everything else that's going to be a distraction from you finding out, building a product that is a solution to what the market wants. And again, it's about really deeply understanding and finding that right match. It doesn't matter the other things. Like there's a lot of things that feel cool and sexy about mm. being a CEO of a brand, mm. of, of a company. Like I've got lawyers now, I've got an office, like I've, I've got a, like, even a limited company. You don't need any of those things. You can just launch instantly, start trialing it and start talking to people, understanding their pains and their wants and in building that solution to it. Um, and I, I wish I knew that when I started yeah. out doing these, the number of things that I wasted. So I say you just have to become super obsessive about understanding that customer providing that service asking them how that service was making the service better getting out there again and repeat and the founder uniquely is the person who can do that because they see across the whole side of it. Yeah. they see the sales conversations they see the customer success they, the, um, they see the product development they're across the whole lot so they have more information about all of this which means that they can make gut shots that no one else in the business can make and you've got to be brave enough to make those gut shots because they're the things that will have the exponential effects the zero to one effects in the business about finding product market fit because everyone else's job is to support you in doing that until you've reached that critical mass and mass and it's probably about that same point that a brand does seven million pounds in revenue is yeah. that you actually can automate and start scaling things out but before then you're about finding that product market fit or that brand market fit or whatever that case may be and then it's about scaling it and turning it into a repeatable machine when you are then removed from it and that's when your job goes from being a founder to a ceo where you're a leader of leader, a people leader, and, and actually the job is very, very different. It's an amazing piece of advice. That's an amazing piece of advice to end on. Um, Paul, thank you so much for being here, man. Where, where can people find you? We've got one camera left. Everything <laughs> else is dying. 
<laughs> well, um, so you can find me on LinkedIn. I'm Paul Archer. Um, and if you're interested in what we do, it's jewel.tech. Uh, you find us there. And um, we'd love to chat to people, geek out on this. Any brand builders want to have a chat, very happy to, to sit down and, 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 and have a chat about what you're doing and see if we can solve some of your problems. Amazing. And be sure to check out their podcast as well. Yes, yeah. Building Brand Advocacy. Building Brand Advocacy. Please, Please do. Be sure to check it out. Paul Archer, such a pleasure, man. Thank you so much for being Thank on. Thank you. Amazing Jones. episode. Guys. You heard it. So many gems in that. Hope you enjoyed. Subscribe, turn on post notifications, rate and review. We love you. See you in the next one. Bye. Bye.